said, you come to me for I am God and none else. None else, meaning there is no one else. There is no one else. I'm the only God that there is. Then in the book of Isaiah, uh, pardon me, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, he said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven. None other name under heaven given among men whereby we ought to be saved? No. Whereby we could be saved? No. Whereby we must be saved. If you're going to be saved, you've got to come through the name of Jesus to receive it. That's the power of the saving name of God. There is no replacement in religion for Jesus. There's no substitute for Jesus. You've got to have Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. You've got to have Jesus living abundantly on the inside of you. And there's no other way that you can be saved except through Him. You've got to come through the power of Jesus. Not only did He die so that you could be forgiven of your sin, but He died to free you from the bondages that face you in your life day by day. Amen. I'd like to be able to stand here this morning and tell you that I came to God years ago, never have had another temptation, never have had another problem, never had a failure. I've lived for God in a perfect arrangement from the day I was saved. I'd be the biggest liar in this room if I told you that. Serving God doesn't mean that you are perfect. doesn't mean that you found perfection. It just means you found Him who is perfect, and you are trying to walk with Him, serve Him, and do the things that are pleasing unto Him all the days of your life. I never want to intentionally do something that is wrong. I never want to intentionally hurt people, embarrass people, or do anything against them. I don't want to do that. That's not what this is about. My nature is that I want to do the right thing. My heart is I want to do the right thing. But unfortunately, when I would do good, evil is always present. So it is set before me good and evil, and I can choose this day whom I will serve. I have found out that if I claim the name of Jesus and look unto God from whence cometh my salvation, it is far easier to live for God the more dedicated I am to the cause of the Word of God. It becomes more easily, more easy for me to live for God. Now, in every situation, it is vital for me to continue to behold the Lamb of God. John, when he beheld Jesus, he saw Him in a different light than ever before. He saw Jesus, he knew who He was, but he saw Him in a different light. All of my life I've known who Jesus was. All of my life I had known something about God. I was naive about God. I remember when I was a little kid growing up, and I wondered where rain came from. And I told my cousins who lived in, in um, we lived back a little uh, alley. We, we lived uh, four, four people in two little houses, I mean four families in two little houses. And it was called Mockingbird Alley. Every now and then, I'd drive back that alley just to remember where I used to live. Not that I want to go back, but I want to, I want to never forget where I came from because it makes me enjoy more where I am. But I go back and take a look, and those old houses are sitting there. The roofs are caving in. There's nothing hardly to them anymore. But when I pull up, I see in my mind's eye my parents out there and sitting under the big oak trees and the old water pump where we all shared, four families shared that water pump. And I remember all of that. And as a little boy, I said to my cousins, they were three or four years older than I was, I said, I wonder why it rains all the time. They said, well, what happens is, I think, they said, you know, when Mary cooks breakfast, she throws out the, the, the wash water. And I'm thinking, oh God, we're taking, we're, we're out here in filthy, dirty water. And I thought for years that that's what rain was. It was Mary throwing out wash water. That's what my older cousins told me. And I didn't know any better than that. But as I came along in my life with God, all of a sudden when I look to Jesus, I see Him in a different light than I used to see Him. I see Him differently now. You see, no longer is He just Jesus. He's my Lamb of God. He's my sacrifice. He's my Savior. He's my God. He's my Lord. 
He's the lover of my soul. He's everything I need. It's all in Jesus. Notice John chapter 1 verse 36. Six. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. What kind of a view do you have of Jesus this morning? Have you changed your outlook of God? Have you changed your, your perspective, your paradigm about God? What is your outlook of Him? In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, and in verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking doesn't mean you just cast a casual glance and, and we just look and look away. Looking means you have penetrated your thought upon Him. Your mind's eye is upon Him. You have focused your attention upon Him. He is the author, and He is the finisher of my faith. When I started my walk with God 40-some years ago, He's the one that started it with me. And guess what? Here I am now, reaching toward, if I make it to my next birthday, I'll be as old as Pat. I'll be 65 years old. Old as Pat back there. And, uh, but, and, and, but not as old as Doc. Not ever as old as Doc. So I'll be 65 if I make it to my next birthday. Well, let me tell you something. I am expecting Jesus to be the finisher of my faith. I am expecting the day that my eyes close in sleep for its last time for Jesus to be there to say, You have finished your course. You have ran your race. And now there is laid up for you a place in heaven that is arranged for you. I'm expecting that. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith. Now, I want you to look, look at these words. Who for the joy that was set before him, that joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I want you to look at that verse very quickly here this morning. You see, years ago I've heard that verse preached, and I've heard folks say, you know, when Jesus was in the darkest of the night, and then in a cruel time of death, and in the pain and excruciation of all of that, he saw the glory of heaven, and knew what it was all about, and endured the cross because he had a joy of wanting to go to heaven. Folks, that, that's not a fact at all. Fact is, he came from heaven. He didn't have to leave there to start with. He was already there. That wasn't his joy. What he saw in the joy of the cross, despising the shame and feeling the suffering and pain, he saw your sins being taken away. And he saw sons and daughters that would be brought into the kingdom of God. That when we gather together like this this morning, we would not be as lost sheep gone astray, but we could be the people of God. He saw the creation of a family. And when he saw men and women and boys and girls and little children like these that are gathered here on these seats this morning, he looked down and he saw the joy of offering them salvation. He saw the joy of being able to come here to Michael and, and, and to Luke and, and I think that's Luke. All these boys, yeah, that's him. All these boys, he saw the joy of all that. And he said, you know, the Calvary will be painful. The cross and dying will be hurtful. The rejection of men will be overwhelming. But I'm willing to give it all in order that I can come in 2011 on this August day of seven and offer to these young boys and these young girls and moms and dads the wonderful gift of salvation. Today is your day and your chance to call upon God. For God is not willing that any of you should perish so unwilling that you should perish, he went to the pain of the cross, suffered the shame, and now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What does it mean to be at the right hand of the throne of God? Well, let me explain that to you. Today, Jesus is not reigning on the throne as a judge. What he is doing today as a Lamb of God and as a high priest, he is ministering at the seat of mercy for you. You come up to this place... You bow your knee before God. You lay your head over on this or lift your head to God. Here's the, here's, the, here's the story. What has happened is Jesus has taken his own blood and applied it to the altar of heaven. And what he is saying to you is, is that if you will come and you'll bow your knee before the presence of God and say yes to Jesus, here's what he will do. He will meet you there 
because He is not coming today to judge you. He's coming to show you mercy. He's coming to show you kindness. He's at the mercy seat saying, Whosoever will, let him come. Let her come. Let any age come. And I will give you eternal life. God loves you. God so loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to have everlasting life. Oh, God is so good this morning. Even looking unto Jesus, He had a wonderful prize set before Him. And the prize was the church. It was believers who would pour their heart toward God, who would cry out for their Maker. And when they would, they would know that Jesus would be there. That at a moment like this, that a child like Bryson and Ethan and, and, and uh, uh, John's boys and, and, and uh, these others that are gathered here and, and uh, the Hanovers and their guests and the Hoskins and, and, and I should have never started naming everybody, whoever you are,